Hi, my name is Tom Grossma, and I'm the executive pastor at Christ Covenant Church. And I'm privileged to lead our first session in a five-week Sunday school class called The Importance of Creeds and Confessions in the Church and for the Christian, or to simplify it, to go about confessing Christ. I want to begin today by having you imagine that you're meeting somebody for the first time And when you meet them, you begin to tell them about your faith. So you tell them how you became a Christian, what it's like for you as a Christian, how you're growing, what challenges you might face. But the conversation that you have with this person moves on from telling them about your own personal faith to telling them about your church, in our case, Christ Covenant Church. How would you go about describing our church to them? Well, you might tell them something about our history. For example, you might tell them that we were organized in 1981 with a small core group of families. Or you may say something about the size of our church, that we have approximately 2,000 members. Or you may use demographics as a description, that we're a multi-generational, upper-middle-class church that is predominantly white. You could describe our location, that we're found in Matthews. We're in a suburb of Charlotte. Or you could talk about our ministries. We have children's ministries. We have programming for middle schoolers and high schoolers. And we have small groups, Sunday school classes, support groups. We have interns. Or you could even talk about our mission program. Uh, You could talk about CO, campus outreach or the many missionaries that we send out and support. But I wonder if you might describe to the person that you're talking to what we are like theologically. So you might say to that person, we are a Presbyterian confessional church. By Presbyterian, we mean that we belong to the PCA, the Presbyterian Church of America, and that we are committed to a Presbyterian form of church government in which the elders rule the church. Or you could talk about us confessionally. You could say that we are committed to the Westminster Standard, so the Westminster Confession of Faith, the Westminster Larger and Shorter Catechism, believing that these are a faithful summary of what the Bible teaches on key things such as who God is, who Christ is, how we're justified, what sacraments God has given to the church, and so on. When I think back to my previous congregation and having a new members class and describing for people in that class what kind of church I was serving at that time, I would describe us in a similar way. I would say, this church is a confessional reformed church. And and what I meant by that is that This church is more than just an evangelical church, Uh, and evangelical being an umbrella term for churches that hold to the broadest doctrines of the faith, like the Trinity or the deity of Christ or the virgin birth or the bodily resurrection of Jesus. I would say to them, we're not just evangelical. We are reformed. We are confessional. We hold to creeds and confessions of the church that define our faith more specifically than those vital, broad truths or categories. And so we could describe ourselves that way too, that Christ's covenant is a Presbyterian confessional church. But we're going to ask the question today, why do we have creeds and confessions anyway? Or should we describe ourselves as a confessional church? What is the importance of confessions? The word creed comes from the Latin word credo, which means I believe. And so a creed is typically a short statement of faith. Think about the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed. And when we talk about the word confession, it's almost an interchangeable word with creed. A confession is a statement of faith, but we might say it's more particular to a denomination or a theological tradition. And so as Presbyterians, our confessions are the Westminster standards. 
And as I mentioned, our class today is going to be about this. What is the importance of creeds and confessions for the church? Or why do we have them? Why creeds and confessions? Or what is the need for creeds? And then next week, we'll talk about the history leading up to some of the early ecumenical creeds. November 1, the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, the Creed from Chalcedon, Lord willing, on November 15, the history and value of the Heidelberg Catechism, and then wrapping it off in November 22 with the history and value of the Westminster Standards. So back to the main question today. Why creeds and confessions? I want to ask that question twice today, and the first time here, asking it from a skeptical point of view, kind of like the question, why eat broccoli or Brussels sprouts? You know, creeds are unnecessary. Creeds are distasteful, aren't they? And under that first question, why creeds and confessions, I want to think with you about some objections to creeds and confessions. And I want to move from being farther away to closer to home or from objections that others have to objections that we might have to confessions. The first objection Creeds and confessions are too definitive and too authoritarian. We ought not to have them for those reasons. They're too definitive. They're too authoritarian. It might, somebody might put it like this, that creeds and confessions, they define truth too narrowly. There's a lot of biblical teaching, for example, that we don't find in our creeds and confessions. Our confessions don't say much, for example, about the gifts of the Spirit or give many details about the second coming of Christ. And the things that are covered in our creeds and confessions, they're things that we believe are kind of set in stone. Creeds, they lock us in. And so why do we need them? And they're just too authoritarian as well. They're too commanding of what we believe. After all, we believe in the inspiration of the Bible. The Bible was inspired by God, but creeds and confessions were written by men and adopted and enforced by synods, assemblies, and churches. So why do we really need them? They're too definitive, too authoritarian. A second objection could be this, that creeds and confessions are divisive. Creeds and confessions divide people. They draw boundaries. They tell us who belongs and who doesn't. So based on creeds and confessions, some people are in if they believe the creed or confess it, and some people are out. Some people are right and others are wrong. In our cultural context of inclusiveness, Drawing biblical or theological boundaries is not very popular or not very welcome. And people might say, don't creeds and confessions just draw another layer of boundaries that end up excluding people? We might not say that with the Apostles' Creed, for example, some of those big and simple doctrines of the faith, a short statement of the faith. But when we get into the Westminster Confession of Faith, isn't that just going to put people out if they don't agree with us on all the parts of that confession? No doubt many of you have seen schools or businesses have a statement for their business or their organization that goes like this, we do not discriminate on the basis of race, creed, or sexual orientation. Well, race, creed, and sexual orientation are not equal categories. When we're talking about creed, what we're saying is that people have convictions. And and when a business or organization says, we don't discriminate on the basis of creed, what they're saying is those convictions are not to be expressed here. They just end up being divisive. And so we got to keep those down or keep them on the down low. Third objection. Creeds and confessions are too Western. Almost all creeds and confessions adopted by the church have either developed out of the early church or out of the church in Europe or the West. 
For example, the Belhar Confession, a confession that specifically deals with race relations and came out of um, the circumstances of South Africa. Some years ago in my previous church, there was an argument towards adopting that confession. And what people often said in arguing for adopting it was this, our current creeds do not express what the non-Western church faces. Or another way of putting it, our current creeds are too slanted toward Western Christianity. They don't give voice to the global church. And therefore, we either, we either ought to come up with some new creeds or maybe we want to put the old creeds on the shelf. Objection number four, creeds and confessions are outdated and irrelevant. So the Nicene Creed came out of the Council of Nicaea, 325 AD. And people might be thinking, well, what does a creed written in 325 have to say to us today? How can it be meaningful for us living in 2020? Or closer to the home, the Westminster Standards, written in 1643. Uh, how helpful can confessions and catechisms written in 1643 be to Christians living today? In this objection, creeds, you see, aren't rejected necessarily. They're just not seen as relevant. I mean, what good can they serve us? And so a good place for creeds, for confessions, is in the back of a hymnal where they're rarely studied or discussed. We're not going to get rid of them. We just tuck them away in a place where hardly anybody notices them or very few people talk about them. They just don't have much profit for the modern church. And if that's the case, then why do we need them? Objection number five, creeds and confessions are unnecessary. So we have the Bible, and if we have the Bible, why do we need creeds? We'll carry this argument further in just a couple of minutes. But we have God's revelation, right? We have 66 books of the Bible. The canon is closed. We don't add to the scriptures. So we don't need creeds then either. Don't we have everything that we need in God's inspired written word? We'll hear this argument sometimes with a couple of slogans. In this church, we have no creed but Christ. Christ is the only creed that we need. In fact, we, we don't even want to say he is a creed. No creed. We just have Jesus. Or another slogan goes like this, no creed but the Bible. We have the Bible. We don't add creeds to what the Bible says. All part of this argument that creeds and confessions are unnecessary. We don't need them in the church. And then to take it one step farther, our final objection, creeds and confessions are actually unbiblical. It's unbiblical to have them, to subscribe to them. Because what creeds do is they put tradition above Scripture. We have the Bible we have creeds, and we end up reading the Bible, people will say, through our creeds. So doesn't that put our creeds above God's holy word? And some might even say, wasn't this the heart of the Reformation? Isn't this what Reformed Christians are all about? The protest of the Roman church at the time of the Reformation, of placing tradition above the scriptures as an equal or ultimate authority? Wasn't the Reformation about recapturing the Bible as our final authority? Protestantism has scripture. Rome has tradition. And don't tradi confessions fall on the side of tradition? If they, if they do, then they're unbiblical. We don't need them. They're unnecessary. In fact, we might even say that they're wrong. So did you see how we kind of moved from objections that might be away from us, objections that we might not believe, to objections that get closer and closer and closer to home, some objections that might even make sense to us?
So we want to come back to the main question today then. Why creeds and confessions? If these objections are sitting out there, how do we answer the objections? How do we ask the question, why creeds and confessions, not with a skeptical tone as we did the first time, but with an inquisitive tone? What is the purpose? What is the benefit of creeds and confessions? What good can they do us? We want to answer that question with four points. Four ways that creeds and confessions are useful and beneficial to the church. And therefore, we ought to subscribe to them and hold to them. Here's number one. Creeds and confessions are biblical. The last objection there, unbiblical. But I would argue that they are biblical. And we can look at this um, response in two different ways. First of all, they're biblical in the sense that we find a pattern of creeds and confessions in the Bible. We find a pattern of creeds and confessions in God's Word. We start off in the Old Testament, and we come to a place like Deuteronomy 6.4. We call it the Shema, from the Hebrew word, to hear. And a familiar passage, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Now, this is a main confession among God's Old Testament people. It was a confession of the truth that God alone is God. And it was a confession that was made morning and evening in Israel. So it wasn't confessed just every once in a while, but they began the day with a confession. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And they ended the day with that confession. It was a daily confession. It was a basic foundational confession for God's people. And it was a confession that carried on into the New Testament church, even on the lips of Jesus. So Jesus quoted the Shema in Mark 12, verse 29. He was familiar with it. He confessed it. Paul referred to it in Romans 3, verse 30. Galatians 3, verse 20. James makes reference to it in James 2, verse 19. And you see how then, not only in the Old Testament, but even for the New Testament church, this became a central confession of faith. When we turn to the New Testament, we see similar kinds of confessions, or at least a pattern of creeds and confessions among the early Christian church. Matthew 16, verse 16 is a foundational passage when it comes to creeds and confessions. Jesus was talking to his disciples and he asked the question of them. He said, who do people say that I am? And then even more directly to the disciples, he asked the question, who do you say that I am? And Peter made that great confession that we're familiar with. He said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus' familiar response to him was this, I tell you, Peter, I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Peter, on this rock, I will build my church. We understand by Jesus' words there that the church was not going to be built on Peter the man, but it was on Peter's confession of Christ that the church would be founded and built, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And you see then, the church is built on a confession of faith. A confession of faith regarding who Jesus is. Ephesians 4, verses 4 to 6, is another example of a pattern of an early creed, perhaps. We think this might be an early creed that was recited when a new convert to Christianity was baptized that they would recite these words. Ephesians 4, 4 to 6, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, 
one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. And then just a couple more examples. 1 Timothy 3.16. Great indeed, Paul says, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up into glory. Paul says, great indeed is this confession that we make. And when you look at your English text of that passage, 1 Timothy 3.16, the text looks different than the rest of the text. It's, it's set off, suggesting this might be a possible early confession or an early hymn of the church. And then one more example, Romans 10.9. Paul reminds us, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It's the importance of confession there that Paul highlights, isn't it? Believing in our heart, but confessing with our mouth that Jesus is Lord. And that three-word confession, Jesus is Lord, was really a staple confession of the early church. So simple, so personal, but packed with doctrinal content and ethical implications. If Jesus is Lord, when they confessed that, the early church was saying, Caesar is not Lord. Jesus alone is our Lord. If Jesus is Lord, then my life is to be lived for him. So much packed into that. And Paul says we must confess that with our mouth. And so we have examples of what we might call early creeds or confessions in the Bible. Or another way of saying it is that at least we can say that there is a creedal tone in the Bible. Well, one might respond to that and say, well, these are just personal confessions or professions of faith like someone makes when they join the church. These are not adopted formal church creeds like we have today. And of course, we admit that these are not as extensive as the creeds of the early church or the creeds of the Reformation church. But they do show us that there was a basic body of truth that God's people confessed together in the same way that we make confessions today. And so when we say creeds and confessions are biblical, what we're saying is we find a pattern of creeds and confessions in the Bible. But there's something else we're saying when we say they're biblical. And that is that we find demand in the Bible for the church to have a clear standard of truth. Emphasis upon the word standard. Paul says this in Romans 6, verse 17. He's arguing how grace ought to uh, ought not to lead us to sin, but to obedience. And he says, But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves to sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. The Greek word for standard there is typos, or model, or type, or form. And Paul is simply saying that there was a standard of teaching that the Romans became obedient to when they became Christians. We don't know exactly what the standard was, but there was some kind of rule, a developing form, a developing model of teaching that was essential to believe in becoming a Christian. We might say perhaps a developing confession in the early church. Another passage that goes along these lines is 2 Timothy 1, verse 13. And Paul says to Timothy there, follow the sound pattern, or follow the pattern of sound words that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. In other words, for pattern is model, or form, or standard all of which is intended to function as a reliable guide. And Paul's saying to Timothy, make sure your teaching is sound by following 
the standard of teaching that you see in my ministry, the basic rule of teaching that you see in my ministry. In other words, Timothy was not just to follow Paul's life example and model that. Or Timothy was not just to emulate a concept that Paul was teaching, but he was to emulate and follow a standard of sound words, an articulated standard of faith, a standard that was expressed, perhaps a standard that was already captured in spoken or written form. Paul, in telling Timothy to follow the standard, you see, gives sort of a creedal background for what the church has done as it's shaped and developed its creeds and confessions. I would argue that creeds and confessions of the church are just that, what Paul was saying to Timothy to do. They help us to fulfill the mandate of having a standard of teaching or a pattern of sound words that we are to believe and that we are to follow. And this is what we see exactly happening in the early church. Within the first couple of centuries after Christ, various early church fathers refer to something that became known in the early church as the rule of faith. It precedes the confessions, the creeds that we have, it seems. But this rule of faith that multiple early church fathers talk about and refer to was a summary of the essentials of Christianity, almost as it were an early or earliest confession of the church. And so why creeds and confessions? First of all, creeds and confessions are biblical. Second, creeds and confessions help us understand the Bible. So we might claim to have no creed but Christ or no creed but the Bible, but as soon as we make those statements, we can follow up with some questions. Well, we have no creed but Christ, but what is it that we believe about Christ? Or we might say we have no creed but the Bible, but we can ask the question, well, what do we believe about the Bible? What do we believe about its teachings? And you see, the fact of the matter is that all of us have our own creeds and confessions that we live by, that we subscribe to. No creed but Christ, in a sense, is a creed. It is a statement of faith that says, I have no other authority in my life than Jesus. Or no creed but the Bible. If we mean by that that the Bible is the ultimate authority for understanding truth, all of us agree with that. The Bible is our final, ultimate authority for understanding the truth and the gospel and life. But if we mean by that that we have no understanding of the Bible other than the Bible, we're being disingenuous. As a Reformed church, one of the foundational statements that we stand upon in being Presbyterian and Reformed is that we believe in sola scriptura. Scripture alone is the authority for our faith and practice. But sola scriptura doesn't mean Scripture alone in a vacuum. Our understanding of Scripture is shaped by church history. It's shaped by reading commentators. It's shaped by listening to pastor sermons. You see, the issue isn't whether we have creeds or confessions. The issue is whether they are just personal convictions, personal confessions that we believe in, that we haven't stated, or whether they are written down. And what creeds and confessions of the church do, how they help us, is that they summarize and systematize our faith. If someone asked you what the Bible teaches, you would try to give them a summary of what the Bible says. You would move from biblical text, from passage to passage, taking those passages and putting them into a kind of theological statement or a creed. Let me give you an example of this. Think about the nature of Jesus. Jesus. 
Who is Jesus? And we can start with the Bible. It's where we need to start. We have to start. And so John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That says something about Jesus, doesn't it? And we could go on to John 1, verse 14, and the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. And moving on, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, for our sake, He made Him, Jesus, to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Hebrews 4.15, For we do not have a high priest in Jesus who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who is in every respect been tempted as we are, yet without sin. And so we go to the Bible. We have all these passages about Christ. And how do we take them all together and come to an understanding of who Jesus is. Well, we might take them and say this, Jesus is eternal God who took on human flesh, was tempted like us but remained sinless, and was judged by God for our sin at the cross so that in believing in him we are counted righteous. You see what we're doing? We take the verses, we understand them together, and what we have as a result is kind of a creedal statement. And that's what creeds and confessions do. They synthesize the Bible's teaching about important great truths. They help us understand the great truths of the Bible about God or about Christ or the Holy Spirit, or man, the church, sacraments, the law, prayer, etc. They take all that the Bible teaches about these things and they bring the passages together to say, here's what we believe about God. Here's what we believe about Christ. And we understand and believe that these statements are not, confessional statements are not Above the Bible, they are subject to the Bible. They help the church focus on the main things. They keep before us the most important issues of the faith. And you see, in so doing, creeds and confessions, they help us pass the faith down from generation to generation. They help us, they become a tool to, to help us um, help the next generation to understand what the Bible is saying. Well, that was my experience, for example, in the church I grew up in. From fifth grade all the way through 12th grade, we studied the confessions of the church. What does the church teach about God and Christ? What does the Bible have to say about the second coming of Christ or about the sacraments of the church? In the introduction to the New City Catechism, Kathy Keller tells a story that as a seminary student, she was hearing about a ministry that was occurring on Saturdays at a local church to inner city kids. And that ministry was teaching them catechism. And she asked the question, she said, why on earth are you having them memorize the catechism? Why aren't we teaching them the basic gospel message? And the pastor's answer was this, these kids know nothing whatsoever about God or Jesus or sin. They've never even heard the words. We're building a framework in their minds of words and ideas and concepts so that when we do tell them about sin and the Savior who came to die for it, there is a way for them to understand what we are saying. That's what creeds and confessions do. Someone said that a creedless church cannot long exist. Or another way of saying it is, without something to confess, the church will die. A third reason why we have creeds and confessions, they help define our faith. As faithful summaries of basic teachings of Scripture, creeds and confessions bring unity to the church. Creeds and confessions become rallying cries around which Christians can unite. And so that's true in our own denomination, the PCA. PCA. 
were united around a common understanding of the Bible as taught in our confessions. This is not the way most people look at it when they think about creeds and confessions. People say, for example, love unites, but doctrine divides. Or they might say, belonging before believing, which is to simply say belonging comes above or is above believing. Paul in Romans 16 verse 17 reminds us that it isn't correct doctrine that divides, it's actually false doctrine. It's not doctrine, period. It's false doctrine that divides people. He says, I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine you have been taught. Avoid them. Doctrine itself doesn't divide. It's false doctrine that divides. And believing is the means of belonging. To say that belonging comes before believing is to misunderstand what belonging really is about. Without believing, belonging is a non-committal, loose fellowship that can be opted in or opted out at any time. But creeds and confessions, you see, they unite people around a standard of common convictions. We're able to say to brothers and sisters in Christ, I share that too. I believe that. You believe that. Wonderful. We are one in Christ, or we can be part of this church together. Now, that does mean, of course, that they do divide. By defining, defining a standard of truth, creeds and confessions show what teaching belongs to the faith and what is outside the faith. They declare what is allowed within a denomination and what is not allowed in that denomination. They set the boundaries for what truths must be believed to be an officer of the church versus what a regular member needs to believe or be committed to. And they also provide a public standard for church discipline. David Hall put it this way. He said, many of us have learned the hard way that the most damning standards are the unwritten ones. In other words, the creeds and confessions that are believed but are not written are the standards that end up being the most harsh and exclusive. Because we don't know what the standard is, and somebody says, wait a second, that's the standard, and, but it's not been written down. You see, it's much better to have public and honest and biblical creeds and confessions. They help define our faith. And then there's one more reason why creeds and confessions are beneficial and important. They give expression to our faith, or another way of putting it, they help us express our faith. Creeds and confessions, you see, need to be more than just pages in the back of a hymnal. There are very, some very practical ways that creeds and confessions help us to give expression to the faith that we believe and are useful to us in that way. First of all, they're helpful in worship. Think about a time when you and the church recited together with your brothers and sisters in the Lord the Apostles' Creed as a corporate confession of faith saying, this is what we believe. I used to use from the three forms of unity, the Dutch Reformed Church, Belgic Confession Article 1 as a call to worship, opening the worship service, reciting it, we believe in our hearts and confess with our mouths that there is a single and simple spiritual being whom we call God, eternal, incomprehensible, invisible, unchangeable, infinite, almighty, completely wise, just, and good, and the overflowing source of all good. We use creeds in worship to help us celebrate the sacraments. And so in our celebration, we might read from the Westminster Confession of Faith, or the larger catechism or shorter catechism to put the celebration of the Lord's Supper or baptism in context. We put parts of our confessions to song. We can sing them. And we can use our creeds or confessions, maybe as helps even in worship and, and preaching. 
using the confessions to shape a topic for the sermon, always using the biblical text, of course, as our foundation. But what they help us do then is give us a systematic coverage of the great truths of the faith. So they help us express our faith in worship, but they also help us express our faith in instruction. They're great tools, aren't they, for helping our children and young people to understand what the Christian faith is all about. So we think, for example, of family devotions using a catechism or a confession. So you might, for example, use, if you have very young children, the catechism for young children. And it starts off with these simple questions. Who made you? God. What else did God make? He made all things. Why did God make all things? For his own glory. And you can recite those together as a family. You can memorize them. But children grow to understand who God is and what he is about through the help of a confession or a catechism. Or you think about the New City Catechism with its questions and answers and its scriptures and songs. Confessions help us at times like funerals. So in one of the funeral folders that we use here at Christ Covenant Church, we have that great question from the Heidelberg Catechism. Question and answer number one, what is your only comfort in life and death that I with body and soul am not my own, but I belong to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ? What a great help, that confession in a time of death or loss or sorrow. We can use confessions in evangelism. Think about how you could use the Apostles' Creed when you're trying to witness to an unbelieving friend, and you go through those basic foundational statements of the creed that summarize the Christian faith. Or we can use creeds and confessions as a form of personal encouragement. Back to that question of the Heidelberg Catechism, number one. Remember hearing a story about a prisoner who was in a correspondence course with Christians, and he had been discipled for a time, And he said, the thing that I wake up to every morning in my prison cell is question and answer one of the Heidelberg Catechism as it is taped to the ceiling of my cell. My only comfort in life and death is that I belong to Christ. So why creeds and confessions? Because people live by them, and we want to live by the right creeds and confessions. In our modern age, you might have seen this yard sign. In this house, we believe black lives matter, women's rights are human rights, no human is illegal, science is real, love is love, kindness is everything. It's a modern creed, isn't it? And the issue then, you see, isn't whether they have creeds or not. The issue is whether our creeds are biblical and sound. We have creeds because they're biblical, because they help define our faith, because they help us understand the Bible, because they help us give expression to our faith. And so we thank God for the creeds and confessions that we have here at Christ Covenant Church.